Go ahead. Thanks, Rene, for the introduction. Thanks for uh, the invitation. I think um, this is a quite interesting study. Um, I can tell you that because I'm only a smaller participant, you see um, that the brains of the study are actually Christian uh, Barmeyer and Rainer Ulrich um, coming from the, um, our hospital in Berlin. Um, and the background of uh, this study is that there was reported, actually also coming uh, a paper from, from our hospital a, a couple of years ago, um, that you can predict the response uh, to a gluten-free diet in IBS patients, especially in diarrhea IBS patients, um, by typing HLA um, DQ2. And it had actually quite good sensitivities, um, however, lacked a bit in specificity. Um, uh, the German guideline actually took it, um, uh, took this study um, as a reason that you are allowed as a physician or you're recommended to try gluten-free diet if you have tried several treatments um, uh, for IBS. Um, uh, and you can find out if the patient is getting better after having made um, the specific celiac diagnostics. So we wanted actually to prospectively and double-blinded study um, uh, the question, uh, can we use HLA-DQ2 typing in non-constipated IBS patients? That means that they are not only diarrheic, but they're also uh, mixed IBS patients to identify gluten sensitives. Um, uh, and we had some additional questions that came along the study. Um, what is the proportion of gluten sensitives in our IBS population, actually? And we had designed a bigger study that we didn't get through um, the grants, so we, we uh, at least wanted to ask this question in an observational way. And um, uh, what is actually a GFD responder? That was a question that came up during the study, um, and I want to elude a bit to that, because that's quite exciting, I guess. Um, and it will challenge some of the, um, uh, some of the recommendations that we made so far. Um, especially the last point, how, how long do we actually need to treat uh, with a gluten-free diet to actually know if this patient is a gluten-free diet responder or if he won't respond. Um, the study, uh, of course, had a number of exclusion criteria and that had also a big impact, as you see, in a, in a minute. Um, uh, I will actually the, the mostly um, familiar to you, of course, we had to exclude uh, CIC disease. Uh, we, we looked at alarm symptoms and so on. Um, the inclusion criteria were um, on the basis of the Rome 3 criteria. So um, uh, you had to uh, have abdominal discomfort or pain for more than two days per week within the last three months. Um, uh, and you had, uh, it should be associated with at least two of the three criteria that are mentioned on that slide. So how did we actually measure if somebody uh, was uh, responding? And the most important tool we used was uh, called subjective global assessment of relief, and that's actually an IBS study too. And uh, what happens is that uh, for a longer period of time, that is 16 weeks, every patient got a call every week, and he was asked a single question. Compared to the way you felt before you entered the study, were your IBS symptoms over the last seven days either completely relieved, considerably relieved, somewhat relieved, unchanged, or were they even worse? Um, and we had quite strict criteria how we called those um, that responded responders. And that was considerably relieved or completely relieved uh, at, at least in 75% of the weeks we asked the patients. So, um, uh, this is the study flowchart you see up here. I don't see, don't know if you see the pointer. <laughs> um, uh, the patient uh, were basically calling our study ambulance um, because we made advertisements all, all over Berlin and um, they wanted to be become part and they were quite a number. So 600, nearly 680 patients called. But unfortunately, although they felt that they meet the, the Rome 3 criteria, they mostly did not meet the Rome 3 criteria. And then those that met the Rome 3 criteria had to go through a four weeks observational um, situation where we actually did this, the SGA thing, also this subjective global assessment of relief already for three, four test weeks. And we wanted to see that they're stable within this time. And only when they're stable, they actually got all the diagnostics. Um, and then uh, at that time, we also 
discovered, so when we did all the diagnostics, two of those patients um, that were still in there were CEX. <laughs> so they dropped out as well, obviously. So we ended up with only um, 35 patients, which is <laughs> considerably less than we entered with. <laughs> Um, and uh, then uh, we, we gathered blood, we didn't do the test at that time, and they went through uh, the whole procedure, getting the telephone calls, and uh, the secondary outcome measures were um, at, the, at the very end getting um, IBS scores that you're probably also familiar with. You see already um, the numbers, so um, we, uh, all of them, of course, got a gluten-free diet, and uh, uh, here you see 21 turned out to be HLA DQ28, uh, 2 or 8 negative, 2 or 8 positive were 14, and um, we did not, as I show you in a second, see a, stati a statistical di um, uh, difference. First of all, the study population, we got a few more, as expected, a few more females as males. We got mostly um, DQ2, uh, DQ8 negative. Uh, we got some more DQ2 positives than DQ8 positives, um, and um, the um, distribution was about evenly in between diarrheic and mixed IBS patients. So um, again, responders, gluten sensitive, were those that answered considerably relieved or completely relieved at least at 75% of the weeks, um, and 12 out of 35 improved uh, at least 75% of weeks, which was, according to those very strict criteria, quite a lot, we, we thought. Um, and what I already told you in that study chart um, is true. We did not see a st statistic significance, uh, a statistic significantly difference um, in between DQ2 positive or DQ2, DQ8 positives and double negatives. Uh, actually, we found somewhat more, however not statistically significant, DQ2 eight and 8 negatives that were responders than those uh, that were either DQ2 or DQ8 positive. Um, interestingly, uh, IBSD patients and IBSM patients, so mixed responders, uh, were um, about equally um, in terms of being responders. So, Summary type, uh, uh, first part of the summary, 34% according to those strict criteria um, were responders um, or were gluten sensitive. Uh, it was similar proportions in between IBSD and IBSM patients and there was no correlation between gluten sensitive and DQ2-8 status. So as um, a simple doctor seeing those patients, we got, we were sort of disappointed when we heard it was only 34% gluten sensitives because w when we had those last talks with the patients, we got the impression that most of the patients actually felt that they felt themselves that they were responders. They said most of the patients actually um, said, well, it was terrific and I stay on that diet. And it was, we didn't feel it was 34%. And you can see that if you somewhat weaken the criteria to down to 50%, um, you get a first feeling that it might be even more. Um, and uh, when we looked at the secondary outcome measures, um, and it was all the same through those secondary outcome measures. I only show um, the IBS um, SS score. Um, uh, you got a better correlation with the 50% responders um, uh, than with the 75% uh, percent responders. So you got more or less equal results, but um, they were better correlated. And those um, in the analysis where you included the patients that were responding 50% of the weeks. Um, and there was another reason uh, to, to ask if we had two strict criteria um, because we, we asked the patients every week for, six, uh, for 16 following weeks. And uh, we had six IBSD and seven IBSM patients, or so a total of 13 patients, that were, um, uh, were feeling considerably relieved or, cons or completely relieved only after two months. And then they stayed on a stable plateau. 
Um, however, they were all non-responders because they had no chance entering the 75% criterion. Even seven of them were non-responders um, concerning the 50% uh, 50 criterion. So we got a first feeling that we were really strict with those criteria on the one hand, and on the other hand, we got a feeling that looking at um, IBS patients with a gluten-free diet and only checking for six, six weeks might be borderline um, too low. And this is um, a somewhat complicated graph also um, uh, checking that, assuming um, that at the end of the 16 weeks you have only true positives or true negatives and that's uh, a primary assumption that does not absolutely uh, must be true but assuming for a moment that you have only true positives in blue or true negatives at the end of the 16 weeks you see um, that uh, the, the, false, uh, the false negatives only slowly um, go, go down to zero. On the other hand what was nice you saw and that was very similar in the other analysis with the 50% uh, responders, that you had only true, uh, only false positives, so uh, falsely positive gluten responders at the very, very beginning, and in the 50% you had them up to, up to two months. And in the combination of the two, um, of these two statements, having 13 patients that responded quite lately, um, and having uh, some false positives up to two months, uh, we uh, came to the conclusion that six weeks of a gluten-free trial might be too short. Um, so uh, we had another um, idea, and that was after the 16 weeks, waiting we, we basically had a, uh, had a uh, final meeting with the patient and we said, well, the study is finished, we, we, we want to uh, get your feeling now and we would like to call you again in a year. Um, and uh, when we did that, we found something interesting as well. That was the one year fo uh, follow up. Um, responders actually stayed on a gluten-free diet without any exception for one year and that is how long we studied the patient, uh, how long we asked them. Um, uh, uh, some of them were doing a gluten-free diet with exceptions. However, non-responders actually didn't switch to a normal diet, what we would have expected. But um, around 50% stayed with a gluten-free diet for a year, and that is a, a quite significant period of time, in my opinion, um, showing that uh, it might be even more than um, uh, gluten sensitives in an IBS group than our strict um, criteria suggest. So, um, second part of the summary, differences, um, the differences in secondary outcomes between responders and non-responders were more clear-cut with a 50% response rate than with a 75% res response rate. That was the slide with the, um, uh, the secondary outcome measures with the uh, different scores. Um, the early responses were mostly stable. Um, there were few false positives. Um, the last false positives disappeared um, after two months. Um, and uh, that there were only few false positives in general um, gave us the feeling that the, the placebo effect that we could not test in this study uh, since we didn't have a placebo diet in there um, couldn't be that high. Um, there were delayed responses uh, in this trial and raising the question if you're, if you're fine with six weeks. Um, complete responders were quite rare. Um, however, there were many um, non-responders in the 75% criteria that stayed on a gluten-free diet. Um, and we called it suboptimal improvement of symptoms. However, subjectively for them, it was enough to stay on this gluten-free diet. Thank you very much. And that uh, are all the people that worked on the study. And of course, the study was supported by Dr. Scher. Thank you. <laughs>